Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us your word to enlighten us, to purify us, and yet your ways are sometimes uncomfortable for us. And so now as we read the scriptures, may we not be prudish about the words, but embrace the fullness of the message. Help us to be open to all the ways that you reach out to us and ready to respond. In Christ's name, amen. Hear these words from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark. The Pharisees, along with some religion scholars who had come from Jerusalem, gathered round Jesus. And they noticed that some of his disciples weren't being careful with the ritual washings before meals. The Pharisees, Jews in general, in fact, would never eat a meal without going through the motions of a ritual hand washing with an especially vigorous scrubbing if they had just come from the market to say nothing of the scouring they give to jugs and pots and pans. So the Pharisees and religion scholars asked, why do your disciples flout the rules, showing up at meals without washing their hands? And Jesus answered, you know, Isaiah was right about frauds like you. Hit the bullseye, in fact. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart's not in it. They act like they're worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, ditching God's command and taking up the latest fad. So Jesus called a crowd together, and again he said, Now all of you listen, take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life, it's what you vomit. That's the, that's the real pollution. It's what comes out of a person that pollutes. Obscenities, lusts, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, depravity, deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness, all these or vomit from the heart. There is the source of your pollution. The word of God for the people of God. This morning I want to make one of your worst nightmares come true. See, that's my job. I'm going to give you a pop quiz. I'm not going to ask you to pull out a pencil and a piece of paper. I'm not going to take grades, but I want you to do kind of a mental list, if you will. I'm going to call out some things, and I want you to respond to them mentally, and I want you to do it from sort of a, without thinking about it really, but just kind of from an emotional sort of, I want to gauge your, uh, uh, your, your visceral response. So on a scale of one to a hundred, one being the least depraved, and a hundred being the most extremely depraved, what number would you assign to the following types of crimes? First, the perpetrator kills an innocent person in order to spread terror to others. Next, a person is targeted because that person is helpless. Next, the perpetrator disregards known bad consequences to the victim. Next, the victim is targeted because of the victim's race or their ethnicity. Next, the person's trust is painfully exploited for the pleasure of the wrongdoer. And lastly, the intent is to cause the physical disfigurement of the victim. Now, there isn't time, and I, I haven't given you enough time this morning to really Think about each of these crimes that I have mentioned to you and weigh the differences between them and really assign a, a considered number. You haven't had time to, to really think about it. But if you're like most people of goodwill, all these things that I've mentioned will strike you as pretty heinous, as pretty nasty and awful. When we try to think about which crime shows more depravity than another one? If we do that, it gives us a taste of how prosecutors have to think when they are deciding the penalties to seek for wrongdoers that have come before them, especially in very heinous cases. Is one of these crimes more atrocious, more cruel, more depraved, 
more vile than another one. And you see, the law itself really isn't much help because it doesn't include a standard which constitu- of what constitutes an evil crime. So prosecutors may charge based on a visceral response or one that might be driven by political considerations or bias or sensationalism. We've seen evidences of this in recent months and recent years uh, in our in our own uh, communities and our in our own world. Now to help those who make have to make decisions like this. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Michael Wellner and his team at the Forensic Panel in New York are seeking to quantify and codify wickedness to be used by the judicial system. In order to develop such a standard, the depravity standard, if you will, the Wellner's team has issued a survey that asked a very wide spectrum of adults to rate 25 violent crime elements. And the results of that will be used to provide evidence-based guidelines to help reduce the degree of subjectivity that sometimes is at play in the judicial process. As Wellner explains it, a depravity standard that is rooted in specific hallmarks of intent, actions, attitude, and victimology keeps prosecutors accountable to fully investigate a crime for these unique qualities so that evidence informs decision-making. When completed, the depravity standard will not be based just on what an offender actually does, but also insofar as it is possible to determine what their intent was in doing the crime. Now, intention can be defined as a mental state that includes a commitment to carry out an action or actions in the future, often in order to reach a specific goal. Of course, the reality is that judging a person's intent is a lot more difficult than to judge someone's actions because we can't really see what's in a person's mind, what's in their hearts. And yet, according to what Jesus says in our text for this morning, Uh, That's where deeds, both good and evil, start. See, Jesus makes this point when he says in the words of our text for today, it's what comes out of a person that pollutes. Obscenities, lusts, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, depravity, deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness, everything evil, wicked, mean, and nasty. All of these are vomit from the heart. There is the source of your pollution. You see, the Pharisees were just, they were all in a, they were all in a twist because Jesus' disciples didn't wash their hands before they went to eat. Uh, my mama used to have the same problem. Your mama probably did too. But you see, for the Jews, this was a religious obligation. And uh, this was, for the Pharisees, a very serious flouting of the rules. They didn't wash their hands. Their hands are not clean. I used to tell my mom, I said, well, they're my hands and they're going in my mouth. You know. But Jesus told the Pharisees that it's not, it is not external things that pollute us. It is those internal things. See, the, the, the religious leaders were worried about the externals of life. Jesus is more concerned about the internals. And he says, if you want to get to the real root of evil, evil is not in whether you got clean hands or not. Evil is whether or not you've got a good or a bad heart. I get in trouble sometimes when people ask me if I believe in the devil. And I really don't answer that question, but what I do is I say, if you really want to see the devil... Just go home and look in the mirror. Because Jesus says here that that's where evil comes from. It comes out of the human heart. And depravity, it seems, very often breeds depravity. Most of you who are here this morning will remember one of the most notorious criminals of recent times, Charles Manson. 
He's the one that directed the 1969 Helter Skelter murders in Hollywood. With a swastika on his forehead and a record of bizarre behavior, Manson has been incarcerated in the California state prison system ever since that time. And all of his repeated applications for parole have been denied. His case, however, took a further bizarre turn in 2014 when it was announced that the 80-year-old Manson had applied for a marriage license in order to marry 26-year-old Afton Elaine Star Button. She had been coming to visit uh, Manson in prison for nine years. Uh, she even maintained a website proclaiming that how innocent Manson was. Now, the two had never physically touched, although they had seen one another through the plate glass uh, in the prison's visiting area. Security restrictions around Manson would have limited their contact with each other to just that kind of interaction, even after they were married. But that never became an issue because the marriage never took place. You see, Manson backed out once he learned that Burton's motivation for wanting to marry him had been simply to obtain custody of his body after he died. She had plans to have the body preserved and exhibited as a tourist attraction. Yes, my friends, depravity breeds depravity. Now, as I think about it, a depravity standard strikes me as a, as, a, as a pretty good idea. Indeed, I think all of us would agree that anything that makes our justice system more equitable is a worthwhile endeavor. But the, only, the problem here is that its focus is on how to charge a perpetrator after they have committed a terrible crime, not on preventing that person from committing that terrible crime to start with. Jesus, however, points to the within part of us as the place where the change has to take place at the very beginning. And so generations of Christian preachers have rightly called individuals and congregations to get their hearts right with God, and by hearts, what they really mean is that that thing that is the seed of our passions so that our intentions are not evil. Now, even though I started this message this morning by talking about being able to codify evil deeds and thinking about the intentions behind them, I want to I want to talk more about the roots of good deeds. For although, as Jesus said, evil intentions come from within, so also do good intentions. Just as depravity breeds depravity, so do good intentions breed good intentions. Now, intentions are worth considering for they are directly related to how we live in general and how we live as God's people in particular. Congregations that practice open communion very often include in their liturgy uh, an invitation to all of those who intend to live a Christian life, which reminds all of us, or at least it should remind all of us, that our will is involved in Christian faith and practice. We can make a conscious choice to live according to our best understanding of God's way. Indeed, that's what part of uh, that's part of what conversion is all about. And why it is sometimes called making a decision for Christ. Part of receiving Christ involves adjusting our intentions. Of course, conversion is about much more than that because it also involves Christ's uh, action on our behalf and uh, his inspiring our will, but the adjustment of our intentions happens because of our decision to commit ourselves to Christ. What's more, in order for this intention to be in uh, to be effective, it has to be decided in a very general way ahead of the very specific situations where we intend for our Christianity to show. 
That is, if we wait for crisis moments to decide whether we will or will not behave in an ethically or morally responsible manner, there might not be too much time or there might be too much pressure to to promote clear thinking on the issue. But if we have settled ahead of time our intention to always be guided by the spirit of faith, then it's a lot more likely that when crisis moments come, which they will, we will react in keeping with our intention. I don't know about you, but almost every time I make a snap decision, it's usually a wrong one because I haven't had time to really think it through. However, you just knew there was a buck coming, didn't you? On the other side of the coin, We also have to link our intentions with follow-through. Intentions are no good if there's not some kind of follow-through. There are good reasons for that old saying, and I know you've heard it a hundred times, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Have you ever started doing something and you had the best intentions in the world and it just really kind of went horribly wrong and you just, the way it turned out was not the way you intended for it to turn out at all? I've had that happen more times than I can uh, than I can shake a stick at. I, I just I go, well, what happened here? See, this means for one thing that our intentions were never really connected to any kind of an action plan, or that there was something that uh, distracted us from our follow through. Sometimes, uh, when it comes to decision makings, all of us experience a little ADHD. You know, we start out, we have a goal, and we're we're ready to go, and our focus is where it should be, and then all of a sudden, ooh, there's something shiny, and, and we get distracted, and we wander off in all kind of strange paths. It can also mean that uh, we make a good start, but then get dis- we get uh, distracted by maybe a bad habit, or by our non-productive behavior, or by forgetting our resolves or whatever. The point is that intentions alone are not sufficient to put our faith in action. They need to be tied to some kind of a plan. Now, one way as Christians that we can do that, probably one of the most important ways, is to use part of our devotional time. You've got devotional time, right? Some of you are going like, what is that? Devotional time, time that we set aside every day to to seek God's will, to read the scriptures, to find out what God wants to do for us. That's what devotional time is all about. And part of the use of that time is to think about those places where we expect to be in a given day, the people that we are likely to encounter. And then we we can consider how we want to project our commitment to Christ in a way that will reflect in our behavior. Now, Unexpected things are going to come up, but having spent quality devotional time and prayer over our intentions will make it much more likely that we'll act in specific situations the way that we intend generally. Now, in one sense, it seems a long way from the depraved criminality discussion to the behaving out of our commitment to Jesus Christ, but the common thread here, and this is important, is intention. Consider that somebody might commit a vile act, but for what to them seemed like a very good reason in their less than sane mind. Just think about in just the last several weeks, some of the shootings and killings that we've had, and uh, when we sit and we wonder at, at the how and the why, my wife, when the uh, when the one the reporter uh, shot the other two reporters, and my wife looked at me and she goes, "Why does somebody do something like that?" And I go, "Crazy people do crazy things." Somehow it made sense in their minds when people commit these vile acts like. A mother who drowns her children, intending to send them to heaven and away from some kind of bad earthly situation. In cases like this, penalties from the justice system can often be different from what what might be meted out if a person were judged to be of a sound mind. Likewise, it is very possible to do a good thing, a good deed, but to do it for less than sane reasons. 
Most of us make crazy choices from time to time. More commonly, however, good deeds are sometimes done for very sane reasons, but for self-serving reasons, where the intention is primarily to benefit the doer rather than the recipient. I, I kind of get twinges of this when I hear people talk about, well, you know, I gave $5 to a homeless man that made me feel so good, as if the primary purpose of the giving was to make you feel good, not to provide some kind of needed sustenance for that, for that child of God. Our intention is to benefit the doer rather than the recipient. One of the examples to me that I see that now that we're in an election season, when you turn on a television set and you watch all these politicians and the things that they're promising, uh, you know, if a politician, for example, pushes through a project to benefit a low-income community, that's a very good thing. But if the primary intention is to buy that community's votes for whenever that politician comes up for election, that deed is also self-serving. And how often have we seen this in the news just recently? And on an individual level, it's possible to help somebody else mainly just to make me feel good. We're reminded of the line from T.S. Eliot's play, Murder in the Cathedral, which says, and I quote, the last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason, end quote. Jesus was very surely talking about intentions when he said in the Gospel of Matthew, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. If you want to go out here and make a big show or come into church and, you know, all that good stuff, and you want to do all that just so that other folks will think that you're a, you're a, some kind of a saint or high and mighty person, Jesus says, then that's all the reward you're going to get because you're not going to get anything from the Father. Intentions matter. Now, none of what I've said here this morning is to suggest that we ought to avoid doing good deeds until we're absolutely sure that our intentions are pure. I have news for you. That's not going to happen. Our intentions are, because we are human, our intentions are always going to be in some small way, maybe even in large ways, influenced by self-interest from the point of view of those that are helped. The deed will be a blessing. Our job is to make sure that we have removed from our intention through prayer, through devotion, through our being available to the influence of the Spirit, that we are as free from self-interest in that deed as possible. In the terms of our spiritual life, giving our intentions over to God, as well as our service over to God, is a, is a vital part of our discipleship. Intentions, boys and girls, are not the be-all and the end-all. Intention has to be linked to some kind of a plan. And only insofar and in as much as we give that over to the Lord, Will those be pleasing to him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we pray for clean hands and pure hearts. Give us lives that are a beautiful reflection of you. Give us hands that work diligently, create beauty, and reach out to love others. Give us hearts that feel strongly break for injustice and oppression and are not afraid to love deeply. Move our feet toward the poor, the weak, the needy. Let our lives be always living to further your kingdom here on earth. For we are yours, Lord. Take us and use us in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. 
Thank you.